אמרנו, נספיק בעד ההלכות על יום הכיפורים. What I spoke about on Sunday to the class was a generic overview. This is more of ההלכות על זין. The ideas of tshuva and the like, those are longer than I can speak about in a class. So just some technical details about anyone can tell me. The light. Hmm? The light. You said the light? Never mind. So uh, what did I mean? Yeah, I was wondering what did I mean. Okay. Erev Yom Kippurim, there's a question in Halakha, whether or not you should light candles on Erev Yom Kippur. Is Yom Kippur a holiday? that requires candles should be lit. The Gemara tells us that every place has a different minhad. In some cities, they lit candles from Kippur. In some cities, they didn't light candles from Kippur. There's a Gemara in the Talmud Yerushalmi, in the Jerusalem Talmud. That says it's a good thing. Those communities that have a custom to light, it's a good thing. What a difference does that make, that it's a good thing? It tells you, what do you do in a city where there is no minhad? the first Jews to come to San Diego, what should they have done? If it's a good thing, that means a good minhag to start. And the Puskim seem to agree with that. That in a place where there is no minhag, it's okay to light. In a place where there is minhag not to light, then that would be the I don't know of any place today where there's minhag not to light. One would perhaps have to check in the Yemenite communities that have a minhag not to light on certain holidays, candles. Because not all the holidays were included in the decree of lighting candles. <coughs> The question, really? though, is, do you make a blessing on the candles that you light because they're only a minhag? Some rabbis say yes. Some rabbis say no. <coughs> Seems like the halakha is today that people make a blessing on Yom Kippur candles. Um, halakha? Yes. Yeah, the people make a blessing. The Shair Tzion writes that in a place where there is no minhag, they can light candles, but it's better they should not make a blessing on They can only make a blessing if the custom is to light candles. What's relevant to today? <coughs> we make a blessing on the lighting of Yom Kippur candles. That's the bottom line. There's a minhag brought down in the name of the Ariza. Are you raising your hand or you're just... No, I'm just thinking uh, the blessing you say is not, the, is not the same blessing you say for other holidays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Do you say or you don't, I'm not familiar... Do you say or you don't say Shekhyanu? No, in Rosh Hashanah you say it after. So the minhag to say Shekhyanu by candle lighting, I don't mean to be rude, is not a good minhag. Why? Because not. one who recites the Shekhyanu by candle lighting is not able to then recite it again by Kiddush. You say Amen, though. It's a problem to say Amen to Abraha that you're not supposed to be saying. Why? In my house, the minhag is, I ask my wife, please do not make a Shekhyanu by the candle. Let's make a Shekhenu together as a family by the Kiddush. It's a proper thing to ask. Because oh. uh, you can't say it twice? Correct. Just, just hang on there. But, but if someone else... So say... Um, you, 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 I, did, I did my uh, regular Amazon. Then someone does the regular Amazon for everybody. But, he, but he's saying it, so he's saying a bracha, so I would say amen. At this no, point, I'm having a mind to say the bracha for my wife. If she already said it, though, and I'm having her in mind, I'm going to create for myself a problem. What's the purpose of making Shekhenu by the candle? To start the holiday, and it's, it's like a, a, new, a new year. Because... I mean, it's like a, a new fruit you're eating, a new, but, it's a new year. But it's kind of the is much though. more binding than lighting candles. And therefore, it would make more sense to say the shachiyana around the time you're doing something binding. Also, like, you're blowing the shofar. Well, actually, it's a mitzvah min a Torah min a and everyone has to hear it and do it. So a Shekhyano is much more binding. With candles, there's questions as to how necessary it is and under what conditions. But also, is that like Rabbi was just saying about, uh, about family unity? If, if the yeah. woman does her Shekhyano or Shekhyano before by herself, then it's kind of like, right. I'm, a, I'm a solo <coughs> act. And then... Well, I don't think people are aware that you shouldn't do it twice. Well, like just for the record, I see that here in this video, at least, there is a Shekhyano by candle Yeah, there is. Yeah. <laughs> You said, I thought you said there is not a Shekhyanu by Kippur. Well, no, I was thinking about Yom Kippur. Why is that? The well, here it does say Shekhyanu by Yom Kippur. For Yom Kippur? Okay. And it could be, maybe okay. it could be that okay. you're right. We're the Nashkenazi community. So I haven't... Yeah, I'm a Kippur. There's no Kippur. So uh, when do we say Shekhyanu? 
Yeah, During the parish there. service, there's a yeah. place. Where? Tell me where. Uh, somewhere either Call before or during the, I think it's be, well, we at the, the start of the Ma'ariv prayer. Since there's no the Kiddush and Yom Kippur, we say Kiddush right after, we say Shekhen right after Kol Nidoy. There's a big Shekhen we make right there. That Shekhen right. is meant for the whole community. But if you already sell the candles, then you can't but see the candles, there. there's no Shekhen. See, the, the she, and I think this is the important point you're trying to bring up. The Shekhen we make by candle lighting is not on the new candles. It's on the holiday. Yes. But we're blessing the holiday by Kiddush, not by candle lighting. Candle lighting is not a blessing for the holiday. Candle lighting is simply a preparation okay. for the holiday that is about to come. The blessing, we first blessing we make on a holiday is always the Kiddush of the holiday. And therefore, why would we say Shekhyanu by the candle lighting instead of making it when it's appropriate to be made on the new holiday? So like with Shabbat, then lighting candles doesn't make the Zuban of Shabbat Absolutely. Real binding on you. Absolutely. You can light them and continue to do Lighting candles? I'm so, I don't mean to make everybody upset here. No, I mean, Lighting candles why, is like setting the table for Shabbat. Yeah, it is yeah. a preparation that we make for Shabbat. Simply, this preparation was ordained by our rabbis and therefore we make a blessing on it. But it, all the mysticism that has been attached to candle lighting, it's, I'm not saying that it's false. Simply, sometimes it's over, um, over exaggerated. Yeah, it's part of the mitzvah campaign. I mean, Kiddush is an absolutely biblical Mitzvah. So we should do a Kedush campaign rather than a... Um, sure. a candle campaign. Yeah. You want to ask something? Oh, <coughs> I, was gonna, I was just asking, because I'm, I'm not aware, like I don't know, I don't like candles, so I don't know what uh, what <coughs> like, the blessings are. I was going to look it up just now. Oh, it's going to be right before Kabbalah Yeah. Yeah, I mean, after we like Shabbos candles, we're not allowed to use electricity. So we are. We yeah, are. You are. Yeah. The custom is not by the Ashkenazim, but that custom is only a custom. Well, if you're lighting candles before you leave for Shul, you can drive to Shul and you can't do Correct. So the Ashkenazim say that for men that's the case. But yeah. for women, I'm they would... <laughs> this I'm very much aware. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. But since more often than not, it's the women who are lighting the candles, there's some kind of minhag that's developed that women don't do any melacha after they light candles. Yeah. Because this is an old custom, it's best not to follow this custom. Rather, the suggestion of the poskim is to say, I'm lighting candles, and in my lighting of candles, I do not accept Shabbat on myself. To make, to make that condition. If you've got a pot of food, or this or that, or whoops, the light's not on here. Shabbat, should, the Shabbat candle should not light, the sh should not start the Shabbat for a family. Interesting. Oh. I always hear the other way. It's nice to know. So the the further we're going to go away from Halakha, the further we're going to go away from our resources. And it's dangerous to start going further and further away. So can I just ask one question? Which is really, what, what, <coughs> when somebody does a communal, the kind of song, and everybody says, I mean, but you've already said the kind of song, are you allowed to say on They're not having you in mind. Well, they don't know why it's on so, so, do I have to say on there? Or you, don't? yeah, you hear Bracha, you should say on there. Oh, okay, that's right. Okay. Well, can you explain what this Shekhyanu blessing is? When you do something new, a new uh, talith, a new holiday, a new, we make a blessing, thank you Hashem for letting me live until this day. And that blessing is made on Mitzvah. But the blessing of Shekhyanu that's done by candlelighting is not on the new candlelighting, but rather it's on the holiday. And therefore, that should be done at the time which we bless the holiday. We do that. We do it as a community. At, 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 at Yom Kippur night, we'll do it here in the Beth Knesset right after Kol Nidre. Okay. The the fact the Chazan will say in the, with the permission of the community. And then we'll make Yeah. What do you think about the custom of you know, in Norse and the Chabad crowds? They offer, they offer you know someone to make you know their own kiddush after someone you know, well, the, the head of household. Not just the Chabad custom. Um, there are two conflicting concepts. Here. One concept says that it's good for you to do your own mitzvot. You know, it's, uh, on the other hand, there's an idea of Berov Am Hadrat Melech, where there's a lot of people doing something together, it has more value to Hashem. <coughs> and it, it's nice to pray at home, but when we all get together in the Bet Knesset, we increase the honor of Shemaim when we say, oh, wow, look how many people came to respect those Berov. It's fitting in a house that one person does a mitzvah for everybody. It's like that by Kiddush, it's like that by Hamutzi, it's like that by Berkat Amazon. The old Jewish custom is one person does Berkat Amazon for everybody. These are good minhagim, these are, are old, from the times of the Gemara you find this. And 
so this whole everyone's gonna do kiddush, everyone's gonna do. I have questions on it. There's a halacha that says the only time I agree to do my own kiddush is in one, one of two situations, where the balabite asks me to do kiddush for everybody. Sometimes I have a rabbi over and want me to do kiddush. If the balabite really wants, then I will do such a thing. Or when I know that the balabait is not proficient in uh, the reading of the kiddush or the pronouncing of the kiddush, or, so then <coughs> if they're offering anyone in cups anyway, so then I'll take a cup and I'll do a kiddush on my own. Um, this thing of doing your own kiddush, there's the problem with it. It's found in the Shulchan Aruch. It's forbidden to say Hashem's name in vain. What happens if I make a blessing that doesn't need to be said? For example. You're about to go wash your hands for bread. Once you wash your hands for bread, you eat the bread. Do you have to make a blessing on uh, meatballs anymore? No, it's included in your hamotzi blessing. What happens if on your way to the sink, you see a nice platter of meatballs with little toothpicks in it? You can say the blessing. And then you want to eat a meatball now. Say the Are you allowed to make a shakol on the meatball? Shukhanu says you're not allowed to. Oh. Because in five minutes, you'll have eaten bread, and then you won't have to make the blessing on the meatball. This is called a bracha she'inat tzricha, a blessing which is not necessary to be said because if you just waited five minutes, you, you wouldn't have to make the oh, blessing. Oh, those meatballs are going to be served at the... Correct. Okay, that's it. Meaning even and if therefore... You, even if you eat the meatball before you make the blessing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So do we not eat the meatball? The reason why you could do kiddush before you do hamotzi <laughs> is because hamotzi doesn't necessarily cover drinks or wine specifically. And therefore, you're allowed to make that blessing beforehand because it would not necessarily be covered with your bread. So should you make a blessing after chamotzi with, on your on the wine you drink? Well, well, we do. No, no, we do. We do it before. We do it before. Yeah. Okay. If you were to bring out oh, wine in the middle of a meal in which you ate bread, you would still make a blessing on the wine. That's okay. Cool. What, what about this? Where people have fruit. Okay, so Perhaps. let's talk about the dessert question very quickly. All the reasons why dessert is included or not included are irrelevant. The question is, some rabbis say that dessert at the end of the meal, the fruits that you're going to eat at the end of the meal, those are part of the meal that are covered by the bread. And therefore, if you made a blessing on the bread, you don't have to make a separate blessing on the fruit. Some say no. Fruits are not part of the meal. It's a dessert. And therefore, you have to make an individual individual blessing on the fruit. So some have a brilliant idea. Their idea is, we'll do Birkat Amazon before dessert, and then inevitably you'll have to make a blessing on the fruits. But that doesn't help. Because that's an unnecessary blessing, which would then be saying Hashem's name in vain. Right, yeah, right. But then you had a question you want to ask before you go. Um, meatballs. So we eat the meatballs and then... You <laughs> wait till after you eat the bread to eat the meatballs. So we, just, we can't eat meatballs then? Uh, it's not <laughs> just meatballs. It's anything that's part of the meal, you wait until the meal to eat it. So it's rude to eat it before. Not, not rude. rude but, you would but, be saying a blessing yeah. in vain. Okay, so wait. But, but we'll but talk more about it later. the meatball, right? After the, the hamotzi. Oh, I, I thought if you see it, you could eat it because it would be covered later. No, to the contrary, you cannot. Okay. We have okay. To well, it's confusing what you said. you got to be patient. I, 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 <laughs> and if you're the one cooking, then we might, be, we might give you an exemption to uh, prepare the... Uh, <laughs> uh, so there's a custom in some communities, like in the old Moroccan communities, that they used to, between Kiddush and hamotzi, they eat all kinds of fruits and vegetables in order to make a hundred blessings on a Shabbat. <laughs> and uh, Rabbi Bani Yosef, he went to war against this minhag. How could he do it? It's a break, it's saying Hashem's name. Even now, Rosh Hashanah, some accustomed to do all those simanim before washing for bread. That way you can make a blessing on each one of the simanim. The answer that the community came up with is that they don't wash right away. They give it a good 15-20 minutes of, of singing, divrei Torah, and that makes enough of a separation between those blessings and the hamotzi, that it wasn't considered a blessing that wasn't necessary because we weren't going to wait 20 minutes to eat the stuff. But these are important halachot to know. Uh, back to my mm-hmm. candles. How we got to my candles, I don't even know. But let's suffice it to say that there's a minhag to light candles for young people. The Arizal brings down a custom that it's good <coughs> on Erev Shabbat for the husband to be the one to set up the candles, to roll the wicks, to pour in the oil. However, whatever candles you use, you should be involved in the setting up process. <coughs> and it's a tikkun. It fixes all kinds of avodot that you did in the past. Rav Chaim Vital, his student, writes that how much more so on Erev Yom Kippur, that if he doesn't do the whole year, at least for this uh, holiday, he should be the one to set up the candles and, and get them in. Add that to the calendar right now. Wearing white on Yom Kippur. This is a custom. It's brought down by the Ramah. Uh, mostly Ashkenazim, you'll see, wear a kittel. Uh, the reason for the kittel is because it reminds one of the day of death. 
and it's important to do tshuva to remember that one day I will also be in the earth with worms eating my flesh. And the Sfaradim, their reason for wearing white is because white is similar to angels. And angels represent purity, and there's a joy of coming into the holiday knowing that my sins will be cleansed from me like a white garment is clean. And today it seems like Ashkenazim are marketing the second idea anyway, so that's a good thing. Uh, the reason why we wear white is in order to uh, show purity. Now, is it an obligation to wear white? It's not. In fact, I'll tell you, I say this every year. For the ladies who like to wear white, one has to be careful not to violate the standards of tznut in order to wear white on Yom Kippur. I mean, if any those who understand what I'm saying, you should understand what I'm saying. Um, there's a minhad for women not to wear jewelry on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. It's a day of judgment. You know, we don't come all dressed up. Uh, we come with humility to court, especially not gold. There's an old Ashkenazi custom not to wear gold, even gold-colored things. It's a good minhad. The, uh, the sin of the golden calf is very much... I, it happens, it either happens in Yom Kippur, associated with Yom Kippur. It's not a good time to remind Hashem about gold. We stay away from gold bichlaf on uh, Yom Kippur. <coughs> There's the five things we're not allowed to do on Yom Kippur. Eating and drinking are of the important ones. Tomorrow what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through eating, drinking, creams, those kind of... Uh, all, all those things, we'll talk about them tomorrow. Bizarre, bizarre. Um, do children fast on Yom Kippur? No. Over the age of nine. Over the age of nine. Under the age of nine, a child should not be fasting on Yom Kippur. Uh, What does it mean over the age of nine that he fasts? He doesn't fast the whole Yom Kippur. It's called a Tanit Sha'ot, a fast of the hours. I mean, let's say he normally eats his breakfast at eight, give him his breakfast at ten. He normally eats at one, lunch, give him his lunch. I mean, it shouldn't be fasting. Rather, we hold up. And at nine years old, it's not causing suffering. He knows why he's not eating at eight o'clock anymore. He knows, so you'll, you'll eat after Musaf. It puts in his mind, but it's also not fair to expect a child at that age to be able to fast on Yom Kippur. And all these contests, the kids come back to school, oh, I fast on Yom Kippur, I fast on Yom Kippur. They should be discouraged, strongly discouraged. It's not healthy. There are some children, it's not healthy for them to fast. They're nine years old at all. Everybody has to know their child, know who they are, know what's what's possible. And the mitzvah of chinuch is on the father. So the father has the obligation to make sure his child doesn't eat. Some say also the mother is obligated here, and therefore both the parents cannot feed their child Yom Kippur. But if a child comes to you on Yom Kippur and asks you for a lollipop, you're allowed to give them. Because the obligation of educating the child not to fast does not fall on you. It falls only on the parents. Mm. Okay. So the parents should get angry. What did you say that a father <coughs> should not feed his child? Should you say that? What did you say about A father and a mother should not be feeding their children. Who should? Uh, in those Uncle hours. Jack. In the hours that they sh they're not supposed to be eating. Oh, oh I see. but if on the night of Yom Kippur, man, the night there's no reason why anybody should be eating at night. They just had dinner. Man, now it's bedtime. Yeah. In the morning, this is the question. But at night, let's say the kids are chilling at night, and he wants animal crackers from your uh, bag. So even you can give him animal crackers. His parents might have a problem giving him animal crackers. Because the, the whole reason he's fasting is not in order to fulfill the mitzvah of fasting. It's in order to, to fulfill the mitzvah of chinuch, of educating a child that one day he'll fast. This mitzvah of chinuch is not even an obligation on him. It's an obligation on his parents. And therefore the loophole is that if he takes it from you, neither of you are obligated in the chinuch, in education, and therefore he can have those animal crackers. Um, in other words, if you just leave it out, and he can take it, or you say, it's over there, you can get it. What? I mean, to what extent is the parent responsible until 10 o'clock in the morning. Until, as I know. After that time, then they feed him that way he eats it regularly. You, okay, I thought you said that a kid could eat on his own between 8 and 10 if he's hungry. Correct. If he ate something, he didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. The issue is on his parents. Now, as the child gets older, you can up this number of how long he fasts based on his health, based on his understanding of the fast. <coughs> By 11 years old, that's where we are already pushing them to fast the whole fast. And the Ramah is lenient, and he says if the child is weak, then also at 11, he doesn't have to fast the whole day. And the Ramah says the reason why you'll find that in Ashkenaz, the custom was not to make 11-year-olds fast, even though Shulchan says they should, is because time has changed, and the children are much weaker. Even at the age of 11, they're not 
ready to be adults yet, and that's why the minhag was uh, to be lenient to them. Once a girl turns 12 in one day, and a boy turns 13 in one day, they are obligated, like any other adult, to keep the fast. There's no, they're not children anymore. They're now adults. If your child needs a bath on Rosh Hashanah, they're allowed to take a bath, and even you're allowed to take a bath, even if you're rubbing soap into their body and all that. And but you can't do it in hot water because that's not allowed like any other Shabbat of the year. Meaning the prohibitions of Shabbat don't go away. Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. That's it, Rosh Hashanah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> By children, we can teach a child already not to uh, wear leather shoes and those kind of things because there's no suffering that happens to a child uh, by avoiding those things. And then we can <clears throat> Sick people with food, I'm going to talk about that already. Uh, on the, tomorrow night we talk about all these. So we wear sneakers with leather and patches. If the leather is not the main part of the shoe, it's not what is the shoe. It's like an accessory. It's like just a nice design. Like a nice side. stripe is okay, maybe? Yeah, that would, I, would, I don't see an issue with it. The pro, no, if you want to not do it, that's fine. But the prohibition is on the leather shoe because the leather is comfortable. So long as the leather is not <coughs> acting as part of the comfort feature of the shoe. It's simply a design. And listen, if other people are going to stone you to death in the business of that, I can't stop them. But I can tell you that it might not be prohibited. So the original original interpretation of why we don't wear leather shoes it's because is because they're comfortable. So oh, what about the tennis shoes? Those are even more comfortable than leather shoes. We can't make decrees that our rabbis didn't make. So even though it might be in the spirit of the day not to wear the most comfortable tennis shoes, it's not a halakha that we can enforce. We can't even make it a halakha. I always thought that the prohibition dealt with the not just the comfort or not the comfort, but the fact that you're killing an animal to wear it. It's an uh, outward sign of, of death. But you're allowed to wear a leather belt or a leather keeper. You are, but the shoes a leather are, jacket. Are the you can come with a fur coat to the shoe. I'm not saying fur coat should be legal. It's simply sharing with you. You could. If you came with a fur coat to the booth. That's okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay in the sense of halakha only talks about <laughs> shoes. And there could be other reasons given for the shoes, but the, the reason halakhically that is binding is going to be because of comfort. Or your motorcycle out. That's a show. Leather pants. I have white leather pants in my <laughs> Jack has a really cool motorcycle. Yes. It's, it's me. Motorcycle rocker. Wow. <laughs> we didn't know. <coughs> um, we say Shachiano at night after Kondi Day, and the Chazan asks everyone to have them in mind. Some say that everyone should say Shekhyanu on their own, even though the Chazan is making out loud for everybody. And they should just make sure to finish their Shekhyanu a second before the Chazan does, so you can say Amen on his Shekhyanu. Either way, I'm not opposed to either, either way. You're going to tell us that? If I remember. Okay. Uh, Peretz writes in his notes that if a woman made in the candle, she should, again, be careful not to make the Shekhyanu <coughs> at the Bitkneset. There even seems to be a preference to make shachianu at night. One of the reasons why we discourage making shachianu by candlelighting is because the shachianu is not on the candlelighting. Rather, it's on the, the, day. the day. Some poskim say that once you make a shachianu, the holiday has already started. Hmm. Which is, if a woman lights candles, makes a shachianu, it could be that she's <coughs> not allowed to drive to the synagogue anymore. It could be she cannot grab that last cup of water she was planning to have on her way to the Beth Knesset. Hmm. And therefore, it is preferable, even just for that reason, to wait until the Beth Knesset to make a Shekhin on the candles. Is there any... So, like, since Yom Kippur falls on Shabbat, do we do also Shabbat? <coughs> so, very good. Yom Kippur actually has the same restrictions as Shabbat. Okay. So, um, nothing... Cha- the only thing that gets stricter is we don't even eat on... on even right. though it's Shabbat, it, Yom Kippur supersedes Shabbat. But even if Yom Kippur were to fall on Tuesday... It would still have the same status as Shabbat, right. unlike Rosh Hashanah, which has the status of a holiday. Uh, yeah. The additions in the Tefillot put Kippur before Shabbat or Shabbat before Kippur. Because all the other Chagim, Shabbat comes or Shabbat the Yom Tov. I don't remember. My assumption it might be the same. I don't remember. We're going to have to look at this. Uh, we have a custom to wear a talit. It's important to wear the talit before the sun sets, because once the sun sets, you can't make a blessing on the talit anymore. So what happens if you forgot to put in your talit before the sun sets? 
Yeah. You put it on just without a blessing. I mean, nothing will happen. What happens if you put on Talit without a blessing? You have to put on without a blessing. Very good. You put on Talit without a blessing. <laughs> nothing happened. Uh, the reason, again, why we wear a Talit is in order to be like angels. Some say in order to remember that we're standing in judgment. That it's a, it's a clothing that has a lot of significance. Yeah. You're saying that you should say the blessing, the bracha over the Talit before the holiday. Correct, meaning hopefully Kol Nidoy will start before the holiday, but even in the event that it doesn't, yeah. if you're waiting for Kol Nidoy to start, you should put on your talit before, make the blessing before. But in the morning, when you come to... Oh, in the morning, that's not a question. Okay. Right. In, the morning, <coughs> yeah. in the morning, you make a new blessing, and because it's daytime... Yeah, it's even a, though it's... A, very good, that's a good point. I'm talking here about the wearing of the talit at night. Why can't you make the blessing after? The because the nighttime is not a time of wearing talit. Oh, okay. Remember we, okay. we spoke about this. Now, there are some scheme that would say it is, but because it's a doubt... When we're in doubt as to making a blessing, we err on the side of caution and we don't make a blessing. But we don't we don't kiss the tzitzit when we say shalom. You could, I agree. Right, yeah. You could. Someone told me had it in fact, years I, ago. You I, can't uh, do that. I shouldn't say it on camera, but I I look at my tzitzit um, every night when I uh, during when I say shema at night. I mm-hmm. I look at my tzitzit. Why? The reason we don't is because how can you say we tell you you see them but you're praying in the dark you can't see your tzitzit. Yeah. But now we're not praying in the dark anymore. So I don't have enough to obligate people to kiss their tzitzit or look at their tzitzit. I don't kiss them because it makes too much of a tumult. But I do take out my tzitzit and look at them. I'm not afraid. So what's going to happen? So I look at my tzitzit. Who's going to kill me to look at my tzitzit? <laughs> at some communities, I have gotten in trouble for it. So there are some places where I don't. I just don't. I know that I'm there. I pray to God. What can you do? You know, one thing you can never win are the zealots. The zealots are everywhere. And uh, the zealots are good for nothing. But they're there. There's nothing you can do. If a woman happened to have said, and then you say it again at Kiddush, does she also get to say Amen, or she, she cannot say Amen? So there's an argument there. Let's say she can say Amen. As long as she has a mind that it's not for her. Okay. Um, what else? We say, Baruch Shem Kavon Machutah, loud on Yom Kippurim, like the angels. Just last but not least, the Middle Chazan. <coughs> we mentioned already in the other class that we had about Rosh Hashanah. If they find a Chazan who is worthy of being a Chazan, it's a good thing that the whole Tfilah, there should be a Chazan in the middle and one to his right and one to his left. Two Somchim. The idea of having two Somchim is we find that Moshe Rabbeinu had Aaron and Chu on each side of him holding up his hands. And so the Chazan that stands in front of the Kaddish should have two people who are Somchim who support him. Uh, it's, pa- it's the best to have a Shleich Tzibur who is a Tamich Chacham. If you go to a place where Shleich Tzibur has a nice voice, he's a clown. So it probably is not a good place for him to be a Chazan. You wouldn't want to hire for yourself uh, someone to represent you who doesn't represent you. In other words, important, even the voice is not so nice. To have a person who's Midot, who's learning, who's, who's Chokhmah, is Yerat Shamayim, is there. Uh, like we mentioned last week, you should be married, you should be over 30, but all the Jews are kosher, so anybody is kosher to be a chazan. Just, these are preferences. There's one rule that I see many communities are not careful about, is the chazan has to be somebody who the people would like to lead them. If people come to the guys, oh, this guy again, this chazan, this cantor, and this is also during the week. There are some <coughs> betakas they've been to, somebody has a chiyuv, uh, they, they think that yours, they have to pray for the whole year, and they're, they're mamash people who cannot listen to this person pray. <coughs> Maybe they have to work on their midot, but so long as that is the attitude, this person should not stand up to be a chazan in a place where people do not want to hear him. So you have to have somebody that everyone likes? Okay, so what about everybody? You're not going to find anybody that everybody likes. Yeah. But somebody who's at least decent enough or pleasant <coughs> enough that people, people wish like that... <laughs> Just to check you out before you come to you know, A chazan is one level less strict than a Kohen. If a Kohen is fighting with somebody in the Bikesa, he's not allowed to go up to Begat Kohen. Because the blessing that he makes is oh, wow. to bless the Jewish community with love. And if he does not love them, then he cannot bless them. Mm-hmm. In fact, the Kohen might need to excuse himself from Begat Kohen if he's having a dispute with somebody in the Bikesa. This is different than a Chazan. A Chazan, you're talking about the majority of the community. And but uh, a Kohen, he really has to be up to snuff with the people. Um, Man, this is be hard. <laughs> the Ramah actually writes 
that if a person has kavana, I'm going to be the chazan, but I will not be praying for those people that I don't like on the side of the Bethesda, his tefillah does not cover anybody, not even the people who he loves. Rough. And therefore, somebody has to really find a chazan who wants to be motzi everybody. He should be rekan, empty of avirot, at least avirot in public. You know, we can't check everybody in their home, in their bedroom, all, all their avirot. But at least he shouldn't be famous for his avirot. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. <coughs> in Batei Knesset, they sell certain kinds of who's going to pray Musaf. And, who's gonna, and sometimes there are people who they don't Shabbat, they don't keep in Kashrut. We love people who don't keep Shabbat. They don't keep Kashrut. We love them as our brothers and sisters. But to put them on the witness stand for us, it's not the same thing. It's, this is not something you buy with money. Just like we get upset when we hear about the Kohen Gadol who used to buy his spot in the Ben Mikdash and Yom Kippurim and he would die in there. Who even let him get in there? The same thing when it comes to Tfilah. How could somebody lead you in, in Ni'ila when he himself, the gates were already locked for him? How? It doesn't have to have that. We, we love everybody, but not everybody that we love do we put on the stand. So do you have like a means test for someone who gets an Aliyah and someone who's a Chazan? Let's say that by Aliyot, the Jewish community is really lenient about this. I mentioned this on Shabbat. By Aliyot, we're not as particular. It could be that because the, per- the person who reads the Torah is no longer the person who's getting the Aliyah. But in terms of leading the actual Tila, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how a person who, who his whole life is spending keeping Torah mitzvot, or at least trying to keep Torah mitzvot, will go to a Bet Knesset where the guy who's leading Musa or Nila or Mincha, he drove to the Bet Knesset on Yom Kippur morning. It's a hard thing. I'm not, like I told you, we love that person who came. We're happy that he came. But even he should know to excuse himself from such a situation. Yeah. Well, okay. He should know. Yeah, it's just, yeah, the, 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 the common, the, I don't know if it's common, but the practice I've seen most is anyone with a good voice is, is a, a, can be asked to. Correct. Yeah. Sound, it's, it hurts me in this situation. And you know, so we, we don't throw anybody out of it because that's not the point here. The point is, it's better for Bata Knesset to have a certain group of individuals that are known to not just know how to pray, but also they're known in the community as people who are observant of Salam Israel. Now, let me tell you, like, if we start a witch hunt into everybody's life, nobody will be observant of Salam Israel. That's not the point of this discussion. Yeah. There are people who have issues that are, are issues that they, they struggle with on their own, they're working on it. They're, their issues they try as much as possible to keep private because they're not proud of them. Then there are people who have Averon that they're very proud of. And those people, we love them also. But to make that person the representative of the whole community in front of HaKadosh Baruch would be a mistake. You wouldn't do it in court. You also shouldn't do it inside of the it's an, And it shouldn't, if a person gets offended from this, you, they don't have a monopoly on being offended. I'm offended that you would like to lead me into a lawsuit where I will lose and end up in prison. I'm offended. Why, why only you have the right to be offended? And what about people doing Teshuvah? I let. We let people do Teshuvah. If somebody comes to the community and re- re- renounces it on the road and wants them, of course. <coughs> and I'm talking specifically about leading the community. Reading the Torah and leading the Torah. It would be a good thing in our Bethesda that before we grow too big that we officially agree on this as a... As a Officially, we agree that somebody, only somebody who is known to the community to have Yerat Shemayim, and it's okay to spell what that means. Because it'll come one day where there are new people, and there are other people, and there are people from different communities. And it's better to make such an unspoken rule. Why do we make the declaration about permission to pray with sinners when there's always permission to pray with sinners? I don't know that it was always that way in the Jewish community. It's a good question. I mean, when, who, who put that line in there and why? But I don't know that it was always allowed. I don't know that we always let everybody into the Vietnamese village. Our Jewish community is one that exclusion... We used to exclude people from the community with the intent to scare them into coming back. So that whole, I'll sit shiv on you if you go... And most people would run, come back running. Today you say, I'll sit shiv on you. Okay, I'm definitely leaving. Who needs parents like you? Who needs... <laughs> that attitude changed. <coughs> and it could be that because of that we don't realize anymore uh, that need to announce you know we don't judge anybody who's here praying with us tonight I'm not sure even though we're not talking about ourselves with the permission of the Bedin above and below we're allowing ourselves to pray with each other I mean, even we are sinners on Yom Kippur if we come to Yom Kippur looking down at everybody else then we're probably not going to have such success with Yom Kippur anyways um, there is an idea 
last but not least there's an argument among the rabbis of Ashkenaz of Shlomo Luria the Marshal and the Taz they have a fight that goes back a long time I mean, was Ashkenazi. sure that Rizal comes from an Ashkenazi family that's why his last name is Ashkenazi because even though he became Sephardic his family wanted to, up, to keep up that tradition that they were once Ashkenazi interesting the, actually that Rizal interesting enough he made a Sephardic Sidu our, our Sidu was his Sidu but on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim he prayed with Ashkenazi Mina hmm. because he felt that in Yom Kippur in Rosh Hashanah one doesn't just need their own prayers but they also need the prayers of the fathers and grandmothers and everyone that came before them and so and only on high holidays did he leave the Sephardic community to pray with Ashkenazi it's a very interesting thing with him there are two Ashkenazi, there are two uh, Arizal Shuls in Sephardic one is Ashkenazi one is Sephardic mm. right, and, right. and I don't know if those are actually the two that were there when he was around but this idea he was Sephardic in terms of practice, he wrote our Sidu, he married into Rabbi Yosef Cairo's family, but his family ancestry was Ashkenazi. It could be that's why he was so accepted among Klai Salim, because he really juggled both very well. The arguments, and that Rashal is not a, it, it's a, from what I understand, is a distant relative of the Rizal. He is a Luria, but not necessarily the no. father or, or <coughs> son. He was, his family was from the conference. <coughs> Rizal? Yeah. Could be, I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, the Rashal says that if you're going to hire a Chazan, you have a Chazan for the holidays, it's best to have a Tzadik, the son of a Tzadik. Because a Tzadik who's the son of a Rasha, an evil person, so even though he's a Tzadik, but it's still worth it to have the prayers of a Tzadik, the son of a Tzadik. The Taz actually says the exact opposite. The Tfilah of a, of a Tzadik, the son of a Rasha, is much more valuable than the Tzadik, the son of a Tzadik. Now he's worked that, that, to reach that place. He's become a Tzadik on his own. To solve this war, I don't know. Uh, for me, if you have a tzaddik, I don't care who his father was, but if he's a tzaddik, take him. But this was an argument in Ashkenaz. Like, should you find a tzaddik, the son of a tzaddik, or a tzaddik, the son of a rasha? Like, who, who are you looking for? Think- the verdict, the, the jury's still out on this one. We don't know what the halakha is. Simply, this was an argument in Ashkenaz. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, like a, like a tzaddik that was a balshuba. Like, cause he didn't know how to pray from like, the very depths of. Oh, so there people. are poskim that talk about this, not chazanim that have been through things in their life. Are they preferable, or because they have a past, not preferable? And again, you find these two camps. One says no, it's better to find somebody who always was a tzaddik. Some say no, actually, the person who who was not always a tzaddik, he comes to Hashem with a lot more uh, broken heartedness. He knows what to pray for. He knows what he needs, what the community needs. Um, Let's say that those should be our biggest problems. I'm going to keep a limb. Yeah. Figure out who should the chazan be. <laughs> hey, Hashem, I'll go through some more of the halachot tomorrow night. Uh, there's so many halachot to do with one Yom Kippur. Okay. So, so there's much. no, really quick, there's no conflicting um, things that we do on Yom Kippur with, and Shabbat. Like, they both go hand in hand, except there's like a except few extra. Except the eating. Yeah, a few extra things. It's interesting question. If a person needs to eat on Yom Kippur, do they make Kiddush? Ooh. And if they make Kiddush, what do they say? Huh. And if it's on Shabbat, do they add in a Kiddush for Shabbat, or is it just a Kiddush for Yom Kippur? Well, there was a Holocaust rabbi that, uh, that dealt with these issues. Is that really, you mean someone who has to eat is required to make a Kiddush? I can, not that I eat, but if you have to eat, meaning it's an obli- this person, for whatever medical reason, needs to eat, <coughs> how can you eat before Kiddush? You can't have a snack before Kiddush. So what's the answer? But now you're going out of your way to drink wine. Who said you need to drink wine in Yom Kippur? <laughs> like, I, I, the, the water I needed to drink, because that's an obli- I need to save my life. But wine is already, I'm yeah. going into the field of luxuries. Dang. I'm not so, going to answer that question. I mean, no. this has been, uh, it's not a, a remote issue, because some people... It's very practical saying, that people eat every year in, in Yom Kippur. Well, I know that, but I mean, people... No, 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 not people who are like, they don't keep Yom Kippur. People who observe Yom Kippur, but they have uh, medical issues that yeah, require that's them to... Yes, that's, that's what I was talking about. Yeah, so that's what's the question? answer? Smart. <laughs>